Have you ever heard of the Convoy of 35? While not as well known as Remember the Alamo, this episode from Israel's War of Independence became a rallying cry for Jews that helped unite them in an eventual victory over five Arab armies. So what is the powerful story of the Convoy of 35 that is known by all Israeli school children? To understand this, we'll need to recall that, contrary to popular belief, Israel's War of Independence did not begin when the British left Palestine in May 1948. That may sound a little odd, because that is in fact when the independent state of Israel was declared, and when the surrounding Arab nations responded by invading the new nation. But that's really too late of a date for the war's starting point. We need to go back to a date five and a half months earlier, November 29, 1947, when the UN voted to partition the Mandate for Palestine into two states, one Jewish and one Arab. While the Zionist leaders accepted the results and agreed to form a Jewish state when the British left, the Arabs emphatically rejected the vote and vowed to drive the Jews into the sea. Violence broke out right away. During this pre-independence period, there was extensive fighting between the Haganah and the Irgun, the primary Jewish military organizations during the period of the British Mandate, and both local Arabs and the Arab Legion, Jordan's British-trained army. This didn't so much resemble a war between nations as it did a sort of civil war, drawn on ethnic and religious lines between the Jewish and Arab residents of Palestine. This was really the first phase of the war, before the entire region was engulfed in an interstate conflict in May 1948. During this period, one of the conflict zones was a group of four Jewish kibbutzim south of Jerusalem known collectively as Gush Etzion. These agricultural villages in the hills of Judea were originally founded on land purchased by the Jews in the 1920s and 30s. The Arab riots of 1929 and the Arab revolt of 1936-39 through wiped out these communities, but that didn't stop Jews from returning to their land and rebuilding their settlements during the early 1940s. As a result of the UN vote of November 29, 1947, the four settlements wound up located in territory allocated to the Arab state. These settlements guarded the approach to Jerusalem from Hebron, giving them strategic importance, but at the same time were vulnerable to attack because they were surrounded by Arab villages. Gush Etzion immediately came under siege from Arab forces. During the next 47 days, relief convoys were ambushed amid intense fighting. In January, women and children were evacuated with the help of the British. Then, on January 14th, the Arabs launched a major assault on the settlements. They brought 300 to 400 men to simultaneously attack each community, outnumbering the Jewish defenders by a ratio of about eight to one. The Arabs were so confident in their victory that they brought hundreds of bags with them to haul away the Jewish property they planned to loot. Defying all odds, the defenders from the Palmach, the elite fighters of the Haganah, repelled this assault. A Palmach sniper stopped the Arab leader in his tracks, startling the mob behind him. Then, wave after wave of Arab attackers was met by ambush and fell back in disarray. By nightfall at Kfar Etzion, about 30 Jewish fighters had held off 400 attackers. At the other settlements, there was a similar result, with Palmach defenders bluffing the Arabs into thinking that they were far more numerous than they actually were, and frightening them into retreating, leaving about 150 of their dead behind. The defenders of Etzion lost three of their own. Although the military victory was extraordinary, the fighting left the defenders of Gush Etzion without supplies or ammunition. Time was on the Arab side, as they controlled all of the roads linking Etzion to Jerusalem and could simply wait while the communities exhausted their resources. Something had to be done, quickly. The Etzion communities had survived more or less intact so far, but how long could they continue to hold out? The Haganah couldn't use an armored convoy to bring in supplies, because earlier motorized convoys had been attacked. So they decided to send out a group of 38 men on foot the very next day under the leadership of Danny Mass, former commander of the Etzion communities. The remainder of the unit was comprised of members of the Haganah, many of them students at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. It was a cold Thursday night, about 11 p.m. on January 15, 1948. The group set out on a footpath that would avoid both Arab villages and British police posts, all while ascending and descending the difficult slopes of the Judean hills. Now, this was no easy task. Each man carried 100 pounds of supplies on his back. They would also have to walk very quietly throughout the night and yet somehow still arrive at the kibbutzim before daybreak. And there was an early mishap. One man sprained an ankle and two other were needed to escort him back to Jerusalem. That left only 35. Although the group was able to trek unnoticed in the darkness, they could not keep schedule. It was already sunrise an hour before they arrived to the Gush Etzion communities. While the details of what happened next are not entirely clear, we do know that the unit ran into one or two Arab civilians, either an old shepherd or two women who were gathering firewood and began screaming at the sight of the Jewish scouts. Now, this put the 35 Jews in a tough spot. 
letting the Arabs go would risk the mission and threaten all of their lives, but the only alternative would be to kill them. Now, years earlier, in the face of numerous attacks by Arabs against Jewish settlements, the Haganah had adopted a policy known as Havlaga, or restraint. This approach dictated that Jews abstain from taking revenge against Arab civilians. Later, this developed into a formal military policy known as purity of arms. Jews would defend themselves when necessary, but not allow their weapons to be stained with the blood of innocents. In the words of the IDF's code, the soldier will maintain his humanity even in combat and shall not employ his weaponry and power in order to harm non-combatants or prisoners of war. Now, we can't know what those Haganah soldiers were thinking on that cold morning of January 15, 1948. According to the initial report that they stumbled upon an old shepherd, the soldiers swore him to silence and let him go. According to the more accepted account that two women discovered the unit, the Jewish soldiers did not fire at them or capture them. Either way, the story ends the same. The Arab civilians reported what they had seen. Hundreds of Arab soldiers and villagers streamed to the area, surrounding the 35 Jewish soldiers. The fighting that ensued raged all day long. By 4.30 p.m., the Jewish fighters had run out of ammunition, and the last of the 35 had been killed. After the battle, the victorious Arabs mutilated the corpse of the Jews, so much so that many could never be positively identified. The account of what happened and the disfigured remains of the Jewish soldiers might never have been uncovered had the British not seen wounded Arabs arriving in Hebron and subsequently pressured Arab leaders to give them access to the field of battle. The tragic deaths of the 35 resonated throughout Israel. The writer, Chaim Guri, memorialized the story of the Lamed He, Hebrew letters corresponding to the number 35, in his classic poem, Here Lie Our Bodies, offering a message of faith that the state would eventually emerge through great sacrifice and determination. His hope became a reality when the war was over. Later, after the war, the remains of these soldiers were transferred to the new state of Israel and buried on Mount Herzl. In 1949, a kibbutz named after the Lamed Hay was established south of Beit Shemesh. As difficult as this loss was to bear, it wouldn't be the final tragedy in the story of Kush Etzion. A few months later, in the early spring of 1948, the end of the British Mandate for Palestine was approaching fast. The British had declared May 15th as the date when they would pack up and leave. Both sides knew that with the British out, there would be a vacuum of power and that clashes between the Jews and Arabs over the land would be more frequent and intense. On March 27th, the Arab Legion ambushed a Jewish convoy, killing 15 Haganah soldiers. In mid-April and early May, only weeks before the end of the mandate, militias from the Etzion bloc in turn ambushed Arab Legion units, prompting a major retaliatory attack by Arabs and British forces against Kfar Etzion. Finally, on May 12th, Hundreds of Arab villagers and Arab Legion troops led a devastating assault on Kfar Etzion. Their armored vehicles and artillery were simply too much for the supply-starved Jewish defenders who held out for two days. On May 13, 1948, the day before an independent state of Israel was proclaimed, Kfar Etzion surrendered and the attackers massacred all 127 remaining Jewish inhabitants. The other kibbutzim surrendered the following day. The inhabitants were taken prisoner and their homes were burned after being looted. The pain that Israel felt at the loss of Gush Etzion seemed immeasurable. 19 years later, during the Six-Day War, Israel gained control of Gush Etzion and the lands around it. The pain of 1948 gave way to the intense joy of 1967, when the children of those killed in the massacre successfully petitioned the Israeli Prime Minister to allow the re-establishment of Kfar Etzion. Jews once again returned and rebuilt their communities that had been destroyed time and again. The story of the convoy of 35, the Lamed He, is one that has been imprinted on the collective conscience of Israeli society. Jewish citizens of Israel are all familiar with this tragic tale of bravery and self-sacrifice, in which a group of talented, impassioned young adults risked everything to save a community under siege. Because the mission ended in the deaths of all the Jewish soldiers, there are details that may never be known, questions that may never be fully answered. What is clear is that the story immediately became a source of strength and resolve for a nation that was just being born under difficult circumstances, and that it stands today as a reminder of the high price that Jews have paid for having a country they could call their own. The revival of Jewish communities in 1967, on the very site where they had been obliterated three times in the 20th century, is a source of pride for Jews everywhere and a modern Israeli success story, transforming scenes of devastation and destruction into places of vibrant life. The Lamed He live on today as a myth, not in the sense of a false idea, but as one of the foundational narratives in the history of the State of Israel that helps us to better understand the character of its people. <laughs>